Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to a brand new episode of Strangers Worth Meeting. As always, I'm your host, Tyler, on the road as usual. But what is not usual today uh, is that we are in the middle of a federally mandated quarantine. I don't know the, exactly the mandates here, um, but we're, we're quarantining from the coronavirus. So on the show, I pride myself in being able to travel across the country and meet a stranger and have a conversation with them. and I love it, um, but I can't be meeting up with strangers right now because that would be uh, negative overall for the population or myself or my guest. Um, so I decided to do a little special episode today. So uh, joining me on the show is probably my one listener um, for, for all of these episodes, which is my dad, Dean Hickson. Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. And, yeah. and by the way, I, I usually listen to your shows twice. So I'm your one and two listener. What is the second listen through for? What are you looking for on the second time? Well, a lot of times I'm running and, and uh, also I have very little that's uh, of equal entertainment value to listen to. So I usually find I like to run through it again and just kind of pick up if I missed something or zoned out on something. Um, or, and also to be critical. I think is a good time to be critical. <laughs> well, that's dedication. I appreciate that very much. You bet. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You know, the format here is a, is a bit different. We talk quite often, but we don't get to spend a lot of time in person together over the past few years because I moved and then was traveling. You moved, so we we, we don't find ourselves in the same place a lot. But we have gotten quite used to talking on the phone or talking on, you know, like a Facebook portal. But now today, I was like, let's record our conversation and that's that's different because there's talking to your dad uh, or or talking to your son and then there's talking to your dad slash son while it's being recorded and will be made public and that's that's a different conversation i i sense you you're nervous uh about this well i, I uh, one thing i'm nervous about is maybe forgetting uh <laughs> that it's a podcast you know but um i you know usually when i talk with you we're pretty politically correct on both sides so you know i, I think i'll be okay you know what i think that does that too it's it's interesting that you said it, and i think it's because you and i have differing opinions in a lot of places and i think where where you actually um love someone and then have a different opinion from them that's where you actually get genuine discourse so you and i can talk about things and have completely opposing viewpoints or whatever and and that i think that's really useful um it's it's way different than talking to someone and sharing all of the exact same viewpoints. It's also different from trying to argue with someone who you don't like, um, because that that doesn't generally give you discourse either. Um, but I just thought you know we have good talks on the phone. It'd be it'd be fun to record them. I think you're an interesting person, but I don't often ask about um, what makes you interesting. So today's today's my chance to do that um, and to introduce the world to you because you are already a recurring character on this podcast. Um, yes, in absentia, right. That's true. I think so. I've, I must have, I must have made reference to you a few times, um, in at least, in at least more than one episode. Yep. I've, I've picked up on those and that's why, that's another reason I listened twice in case, you know, I miss a, a passing reference. Or, an, or a passing insult, potentially. <laughs> yeah, I definitely don't want to miss that. <laughs> well, it'd be hard not to. I think you, you in a lot of ways, um, uh, introduced me to a lot of the things that I, I'm into and do and helped me learn how to think for myself. And so it'd be, it'd be hard not to credit you with a lot of those, a lot of those things. Um, what's cool actually too, as you get older is that you get to start teaching your dad stuff. Um, like, like I have been, uh, into the health and wellness game and, and getting weirder and weirder with it as I've gone for, I, how long have I been doing that? Maybe a couple of years now? Yeah, I would say two or three. I mean, it was it was pretty dramatic when you started to do that, and uh, you know you weren't getting like crazy fanatical about it, but it was uh, it was noticeable that you all of a sudden all of a sudden were picking up on the health food issues and just healthy living lifestyle stuff. I think a lot of that obviously you got from Andrea or you guys gave that to each other, but um, it was a, it was a great thing to see. It immediately put me into a you know a bit of a spiral of guilt for all the times I took you to McDonald's um, as a child, but. You know, you're getting over it okay. I don't think that there's... See, the thing is, I think that guilt level should be really low. And for a number of reasons. Um, probably not the least of which is that I wouldn't know the things I know without the benefit of a massively developed internet. Um, and I that wasn't necessarily a resource that you guys had. And you were just trying to, to be parents um, and <laughs> get us food. And it, I, think that, I think that if you had had all of the 
all of the dad blogs that are out there now at your disposal, I, I can't imagine you would have avoided that, that knowledge, but I don't think it existed at the time. Well, thank you. That, give me the benefit of the doubt. I appreciate, I appreciate that. I mean, that's true though, isn't it? I mean, because yeah. it's one thing we had the internet, but I can specifically remember when we got dial up at home. Um, and it was the slowest thing in the world and it wasn't really useful for anything. And I think that that's, there's like a two stage process, which is that first we built the machine that was the internet. And then the second piece is that we had to fill it up with all of our stuff. And now to an extent we've done that and you can find information about just about anything now. And I think that's how I found health information. And that was also probably a good thing for me to do on my own. I, um, we have family members who are, who are arguably more into nutrition and health than we are. I would say one of your brothers was yeah. always pushing uh, to do that. Has he always been that way? Uh, let me think about that. Yeah, I, I think so. From the moment he was out on his own, this is my oldest brother. Um, I think he started to go in that direction. Uh, certainly once he got married, um, He's always had an interest in healthy lifestyle, was very active, but I think his, his uh, sort of expertise about food and brewing his own beer and, and all that stuff is just, it's been, uh, he's a very much type A, you know, so, right. so um, he doesn't do anything halfway, uh, but yeah, he's been do, doing that for a long time as well. Yeah, I just saw him a few months ago, and he was he was jealous of my motorcycle, and he was telling me not just about the motorcycle he wants to get, but the second motorcycle he wants to get. Yeah, <laughs> it made me think of that. But no, I think yeah, that's I see. I don't think if I had been raised on nutrition, I would have enjoyed it. I really don't. I think that there's a lot of things that I appreciate that I didn't know as a kid that I got to learn about uh, as mm -hmm. a, as an adult and as I developed my own kind of mind for things that. Yeah that made a difference for me and maybe I'm wired in some way. I don't think I like being told what to do. I think you'd probably back me up on that. Yep. Um, so when I find something for myself, as long as it's a positive thing, then that's probably good news because there's a good chance I'll get into it. That is a true statement. And, uh, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't intend that as a criticism, but I think there've been times in your young life when your, your mother and I would say, well, we should really, you know, tell Tyler about this. And we would, more likely say, well, let's engineer a way for Tyler to find out about this on his own. And, That's and so, are you serious? Take... Is there a is there a genuine example of that? Because I have no idea. Oh, okay, well, I'll get in trouble if I if I come up with one. Um, you know, as we sit here, if I can think of one, I'll let you know. But I'll tell you what, that was in my mindset for sure. There's a lot yeah. of times where it's like, boy, it'd be great to push Tyler in this direction, but I'm not going to do it directly. <laughs> That's an independent soul right there. I mean that as a compliment, sir. But um, I, I do think, I mean, to some extent, um, well, sure we did. We adapted our, our parenting to the person we had before us. And you were, I guess it's fun, it's your podcast for me to you know, compliment you. But I mean, from an early age, I think you were able to think like an adult. Um, and I, I don't think, it, it, I can't remember a time really when we approached you as a child or really tried to, if there's anything we really wanted to stick with you, we knew better than to just dictate it, you know, and um I'm, I'm, I'm kind of proud of that notion of child rearing. Um, but in many ways, I think you forced that out of us as parents, you know, I, I don't think the traditional parenting would ever have worked. And in retrospect, I feel a lot, um, I feel a lot more accomplished as a parent, um, for your mother and I having sort of raised you the way we did and treating you and your sister, in my opinion, um, you know, sort of above average in terms of respecting you and, reasoning with you uh, from a pretty young age patting myself on the back a lot my point no was... i think you should i this <laughs> this uh, this is what we came here to do because it's questions i've yeah. never asked i wouldn't i wouldn't have suspected that i was sort of um those inclinations were almost being used against me <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> strategically but I, it makes yeah. sense i mean what else would you do I, how... well and i was trying to think of anything that caught on that you know that we oh we got him you know i don't think that ever worked anyway, sure so <laughs> but you know it's just it was there i think yeah well i get that and also well i should back up too because that's not to say um that while while we did eat the occasional mcdonald's and i have fond memories of that too because uh, you know while we have not i want to say our restaurant streak is at um maybe three or four months now okay. uh yeah, we're doing pretty good at, at cooking everything. It's helpful during a quarantine also to know how to cook people. Uh, makes a big difference. So while that is what we're doing now, I still can think about, you know, some very good meals uh, that I that I got from a, from a McDonald's or similar situation. I, I, was, I was raised on restaurant food and I liked it a lot. It's quite good. 
You realize that you just said that uh, it's helpful in a quarantine to know how to cook people. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a comma in there that I was implying. Oh, okay. I was... Okay. Yeah. Although I'm I'm back deep in the woods of East Texas, I you know, if someone stumbles on my campsite and I'm hungry, it's not yeah. impossible to think that, uh, you know... I'd on, a, a... on a less... Well, yeah, I've seen memes already about that, like Hannibal Lecter um, memes, you know, regarding... Because people can't get really access south. to food or something? Yeah. For now, where we're at in West Lafayette, Indiana, um, I take comfort in the fact that there's about four rabbits that come around on our backyard because we're, <laughs> we're putting out red cabbage, and they're so adorable. Oh. You know, but in the back of my mind, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go on YouTube and see how it is that you actually prepare rabbit. If um... All right, this isn't funny. I'm sorry. No, it's not. Uh, it's not, because we're not <laughs> quite there yet. I have been doing yeah. a lot of... Um, the Walmart pickup. And as much as I love it, sometimes you get a bad store. And the one we're at here, they'll just tell me things are out of stock that aren't out of stock. So I'll get an email that's like, we couldn't get you these four items. And so I'll have to go to pickup. And like, I just did this yesterday. And I'm like, you know, Andrew and I will go to the pickup. She'll wait in the truck. I'll pop inside and I'll go get the four things they told me they didn't have. <gasps> You're kidding. Which is like bananas and radishes. Like, okay, you've got bananas and radishes. So whatever. I, but yeah we've been we've been making do with that but you know it's like i don't want to have to go in this store i do i do go in i keep my space trying not to touch anything and i'm trying to be responsible but it's like I, you know I, I need i need to be able to have some bananas here and i tried to go through your system and you just said no there's no bananas um, yeah i think that's got to be a conscious choice because yeah. I, I would imagine they're overwhelmed and if they had to grab the little plastic bags and weigh it for you and, and all that would go into that maybe that's just overwhelming but it'd be nice if they had a message you know, come get it your own dang self as opposed to we're out of it. Well, that wouldn't, <laughs> not I don't think that would do very well for their PR. That wouldn't be very responsible of them because the pickup uh, is probably our best option to limit contact. It's like, you know, you pull up now, typically they even have you sign on their little devices to say you picked it up. And the dude I just, uh, we just went and picked up from, he was like, do you want me to sign for you? I was like, yeah. yeah. So we didn't even have to touch. And it's just, right. here's your groceries in the back seat. You know, once you get the groceries put away, maybe wash your hands. Cause obviously those have all been touched. Um, that is kind of the scary part too, that I hear it can live for like two to three days on plastics. And That's so right. if you have a package of, I don't know, lettuce or something and you put it away in your fridge, you're not done. I mean, it's, Unless yeah. unless I'm going to spray Lysol all over my lettuce, which I'm not going to. So. I have been the, the go-to grocery person, and uh, I go alone. And by the way, I've, I've seen some parents who bring their adult kids to the store with them, and I'm thinking, I don't understand that, um, but let's not be judgy. Um, <laughs> but the regimen that I use when I get back here to remove the food from the bags sure. is, is comical. And it's the same thing with, uh, we get, you know, Amazon deliveries still, including some food occasionally. And it's the same thing. It's like, yeah, I've seen the pandemic movies and this is probably what I should be doing. Um, it's, it's really weird times, but even then there's, there's all kinds of ways for it to get in. And I guess I, I, I don't, I don't really have a lot of fear yet at the moment in the region that I'm in, that it's going to, you know, take hold enough for me to really worry about it, but I don't mind practicing the regimen in case, things do go nuts. I think, you know, we don't really know what to expect and um, I'm getting used to it. I'm getting used to not shaking hands with people, obviously. And uh, I'm much more conscious about touching my face if my eye itches, which it does incessantly at the grocery store. It's because store. you can't. It's because you can't. I <laughs> <Exactly>. swear. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I just, I just sweat it out. There'll be a tear coming out of my eye, but I'm like, you know what? I am not touching my eye right yeah. now. It's, hey, it's an interesting way to pass the time, I guess. Yeah, it's a yeah, it's, it's a fine line right now too, and we we obviously want to be responsible, um, but then it, there's other sort of responsible ways to live. Like, like I I'm gonna need to be able to go to the grocery store maybe at least once a week so I can actually get some food to eat. Unless you want me to start stockpiling, and that's what we're trying not to do. So there's right. there's some pieces of contact where it's like I can't I can't be locked inside unless you want me to go cause a problem a shortage of food by stockpiling, which is ultimately what has been happening. Um, so we're at a, a cross section. Is that the right word? I don't know. Crossroads, I guess right now Yeah, sure. in, uh, in East Texas. And I just talked to you about this the other day on the phone that we have to decide, are we, are we going to continue heading to the East coast? That was kind of where we had some work lined up. If this thing were to end soon, I'd rather be kind of closer to the East coast so we can pick right back up where we left off. Or if this thing's going to last a long time, we'd probably rather go out West. You know, there's some States in the southwest that don't have too many cases of this it's pretty low-key out there and we really know of some areas we enjoy and we just wait it out somewhere we like so but i, I yeah. think ultimately now we're starting to see 
this this still may be a while. Um, it, it's 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 gonna take a while. So I think we're heading heading back out east. I'm just gonna suck it up and make that long drive, um, or back out west. Did I say east? West, yeah, back right. out west. Yeah. Um, but before we went down the coronavirus rabbit hole, I was trying to give you credit for something because it it was oh. we we didn't just eat fast food. We didn't just sit around eating fast food. I particularly remember from my childhood that your running was a really strong point in um my upbringing so you would you would run and train for quite a number of races and marathons or half marathons and i would be up with you every every well not every chance i got but quite often at least on the weekends and i'd get on my bike and go biking with you or else i'd run with you if i could um that was something that we uh did quite often so there was never a sense of like of sitting still or just lounging around i i remember when all my friends had um video game consoles and i think that there's like a really adaptable point in time where if you give someone a video game console they will be um sort of stuck to it almost eternally um and i didn't have one so i had to make my own fun and play outside and had that real classic kind of childhood so all of that played a factor into it, but you you have an an obsession with running. And how how many marathons have you completed in your in your career there? Four question mark four four <laughs> four point yeah. five. I remember a bad injury in the midst of a marathon. Well, I finished that, but yeah, you did that finish. Was, uh, yeah, I did. That was there was the Illinois marathon, and I popped my calf muscle and called everybody and said, "Yeah, don't wait for me at the stadium." Blah 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 blah. And then I was like, I just kept walking and hobbling, and next thing I knew, I was kind of jogging again, and it was not a normal calf muscle tear apparently because I was able to keep moving, but that was fun. That wasn't the um, one I was remembering. I was remembering the first Walt Disney yeah, World marathon. That was the two thousand eight fail. Uh, <laughs> which I was so excited about. Yes, that was great. We had family. The in-laws came down to uh, to uh, vacation at Disney World with the main purpose, at least, being, yay, watch Dean run in a marathon. And uh, you and I were playing in the... Well, no, we were actually... You were running with me, but I made the mistake at my age of kind of sprinting at the end. And that was the uh, that was actually the beginning of calf, mu- calf muscle troubles. And so... I think I was that year, 2008. There's no place to go look this up, but I think I was probably the first person to to DNF to drop out of the uh, Disney Marathon in 2008 because it was shortly before the one mile mark when you could almost hear my calf pop, it, ah. and, and I just uh, I gave up and called everybody. Uh, that was fun. <laughs> but but redemption. Don't, let's not forget the positive side on this because the next year you came back and you not yeah. only did the marathon but you did the the um, what is that challenge called the goofy challenge is that what's called it's called the goofy's challenge and, and now yeah now people get nuts and do like four different races and it's a dopey challenge and all that but i was happy that was that was cool you're right so I, you did not, a you know, people go ahead it was a 5k the first day and then a half marathon day two and then a full marathon day three is that the schedule if i remember right that's what it was back then yeah and and now they actually have a 10k um, so you can do four different races, Ooh. and it's got to be a gazillion dollars of entry fees to do that right now. Um, it wasn't cheap when we did it, <laughs> but yeah, this was cool because that was 2009 then. And um, you know, it's one of those things. I, you get me started talking about marathons, and it's it's a pet peeve for a lot of people because you can't shut people up if they run a marathon. They want the world to know it. And actually, by the way, I get that because it really, especially the first one I did, man, that was really something. But um, I mean, I uh, I don't think that that's wrong though. I why, yeah. I, I will. And, oh, people okay. can get insufferable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, them, you know. that I get. But let's admit that running twenty six point two miles is a serious achievement. That is, that's hard. That's yeah. I, it's painful. It's stupid. It's probably more <laughs> stupid than it is anything else. Well, so I got so I got two things now. So um, first of all, yes. Uh, so I did I did Chicago, and I I'm stuck on what year that was. I, I you were there it was was it 2005 it was around there yeah right? that sounds about and right I, I that was a magical experience my first marathon but there were times within it and this is actually part of what made it really cool was that it was so freaking painful um and it got into my head i mean psychologically when i hit like mile 2021 20, it just felt like i hit the wall there is such a thing um and it was it was just shredding me uh, but i'd spent so much time training for it and at the time it, I, I think people's opinions have kind of changed now but 
The point then was to run the marathon. If you take one walking step, it's like you gave up, right? Now, people don't feel that way, and this is good, I think. People don't feel that way about marathons now. You can walk, run, walk, run, and some people uh, can walk, run, and do it just as fast. It's a cool thing. But so anyway, at the time in Chicago, that was, it was a thing, um, at least I felt like it was, to not take a walking step. To make it, you had to jog at least the whole thing, right? And I just wanted to die. There were people who were cheering directly for me. And I almost I very literally wanted to just pull over and smack somebody. It, just, <laughs> it, it might, you know, it, it was just my, my head was gone. It was so yeah. weird. Um, and this is why I'm telling this because by the time um, I had used a much better training regimen, uh, even though I did hurt myself at the end of it, that wasn't the training regimen's fault. In 2009, when we did it, I had a delightful time. It, it never, it never felt like I was in great pain or anything. Um, and that was just where I, I got to a point at, it's gone now where <laughs> I felt like I could, as long as I could Gatorade it up and, and get a, the occasional power bar, I could go on like a machine perpetually. Um, and that feeling's gone now. I can't do it. But there was a time when I could, and that was really nifty. And in a way, it was one of the takeaways from screwing up in 2008. Um, I, I was then, I, I got my, my calf back together, and I had an amazing time. I ran the Virginia Beach Marathon later, and a few months later, um, just as my kind of makeup. And... And I loved it. And, and it, it, it's hard to describe what a dark moment that was when I was unable to do the Disney marathon. But it's always become for me a little bit of a story about you just never know how, if you persevere, how a bad story can turn into a good one. Because I will never forget how amazing that was in 2009 uh, when, when you and I together were able to do the, the half marathon uh, and then I was able to finish up the Goofy the next day. So it looks like bouncing back stronger than ever. It gave me an excuse to go back again, you know. Um, and I had that experience with you. And I honestly think it, it's, it's, it's a little bit of an analogy of, you know, life, whatever. It's, it's a minor thing. But um, that pattern, I think, is something that I do bear in mind when things are screwy. That I am kind of looking forward to... Um, something that is going to, you know, at the end of it, it's just going to feel like, wow, that's something I look back on now and things have improved. And there was, hopefully there's even kind of a pattern or a reason for it. Um, but I think just that, that, especially because it was really stupid that I, I got so down on myself. Um, of course it was in the dark. Uh, but, but it just, I think it, it made me a little better able to see past minor tragedy and sometimes larger ones uh, and recognize that the way things are today, they're not going to be this way a week from now or a month from now. Um, and carrying that perspective, the things that used to annoy you are in a sense going to fascinate you later. And um, they could become character building stories. You know, I'm over talking it, but that's, that's how I feel about that experience. And the moral of the story was I got to run with Tyler. And uh, as you know, that was something I loved doing and you were, amazing about uh, those times you would go out with me and support me. Uh, you were the reason I was able to do some of those initial marathons because it was mundane and boring to go out for a run. But if your cute little son on his bicycle is, is right there with you, <laughs> it, it was, it was a perfect combination. You know, I was not a, I was not a golfing daddy who was going to go away for four hours or five the way I play it. Um, but if you're going to come out with me on that run, that was freaking quality time. And it, it meant the world to me. So there. Yeah. No, I get that. Day. <laughs> I get that. And I well, you've you've brought up a lot of thoughts from me within that, which is you know I think on on sort of the um, the most general self help note possible. Uh, it's it's about keeping that perspective in those low moments of of the fact that you know that they won't be that way forever. And I think as a even as a nation or maybe potentially well yeah as a world right now, uh, we're in precisely one of those moments where we have to remember that things things do end, things get back to normal, Every everything becomes okay again, um, and, and consistently has over time. And, and beyond that, I think that sometimes we shield ourselves from failure, because we're so afraid of failure, but in many cases, that's the thing that's going to build us back up. I think um, the, the only reason I'm allowed to say that is because I, I get to be a genuine entrepreneur and have had failure moments and success moments, and I see that the more I shy away from taking risks, the the worse things become. Um, you you actually want to be able to take a risk and to fail in that way. Um, 
You know what's I, funny is, um, thanks to you, I was listening to Billy Corgan on Joe Rogan's podcast. That's a great episode, by the way. Uh, Smashing Pumpkins lead, among other things, and and that's exactly what he was saying. Um, you know, he reached he reached a point where uh, he hit a failure point, and it changed everything. And then in a sense, it made him kind of who he is now, and it's very true. I, you know, what I want to say this about coronavirus because I have, I don't have what you call historical perspective. I come from a generation that has just been cradled. Um, mostly post-Vietnam. I mean, that was still going down, but I was not even really cognizant yet. And then since then, in the in the arc of, you know, American stories, we've not had the kind of big, big picture um, sacrifice kinds of things. In terms of us having to change lifestyles or seeing paradigm shifts, um, we haven't had a whole lot of that. But I do want to say coronavirus, coronavirus feels different in that um, for a long time, people have been warning us about this sort of pandemic stuff. And, and I do think things are going to change now. I still think that that message of don't be afraid of it. Um, and I know you feel the same way is like, you know, let's see what the new normal is. I don't think we're going to go back to an old normal in, in many ways. I mean, for one thing, it's going to be a long time before our economy resembles what it used to be, if, if it ever does. Uh, and there could be a complete shift in how we ho- address the whole socialism, capitalism picture um, for a long time to come. But that sense of hope um, is, is still something that's important to hang on to, and I think it's justified. Over all these many years, you know, I, I feel like things are always going to kind of work out for the better. They're not always going to be easy, but I'm pontificating now. Well, in, in general, we move towards um, betterment of lives globally. I think... We, we typically have, and I even have a fairly negative view overall on civilization. And there's a, there's a great book um, by Dr. Christopher Ryan, who's one of my favorite authors. It's called Civilized to Death and talks about sort of um, how rough civilization is on people. But in general, it's hard to ignore the fact that, that overall quality of life tends to get better over time for most people. Um, mm. At the same time, there's total dangerous things i I think it's uh it's scary when we look at sort of how we've distributed the world's resources uh every time i hear that stat about you know the 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 richest 10 people own half of the world or something like that and you're like how did we get there um that that's a pretty scary fact to me but what i'm most fascinated by this whole virus right now is and i can't stop thinking about this um i can't i can't actually remember how much i talked about this on the last podcast with um, with Archie uh, in Austin, and but, but so forgive me if I repeat anything, but I always feel like uh, you can you can see certain moments in history where major changes are ready to happen, and then circumstances occur which open the world up to those changes, and then big things happen. So I think that um, and, and another book I love sapiens by yuval harari he talks about all of these sort of major shifting points throughout the world um and i i feel like we're potentially in a major one right now um the you've seen the movie office christmas party right the one with um oh gosh who's the main guy in that it's got tj miller jennifer aniston um i can't think of oh jason bateman that's who it is i'm going to admit that i have not seen it Okay, so there's this really contrived moment at the end. It's a total uh, deus ex machina. It's 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 really rough. Essentially, they knock out the power grid for this whole city, and that that sort of clears out the the power grid lines somehow. That that now they're able to institute this new technology where they can have Wi-Fi coming out of all of your electrical sockets or something like that. I, I the the it's it's a it's a a good moment for writers and a bad moment for engineers. Um, but I, I feel like when you knock everything out in in one fell sweep, then we have an opportunity for new technology to emerge because everything got really quiet for a second. Um, and while you can make incremental changes while the world is sort of puttering along, when a major thing puts the world on pause, you can have massive shifts. So we are poised for... Um, automation uh we are poised for work from home we are poised for um online communication being the sole way we communicate we're poised for um so so many of these different things technologically and all of a sudden we have to do all of them at once so all education has to be online for 
I don't know, two weeks to a month or maybe even longer. So that's going to create major shifts there. Uh, you must all work from home now, which obviously I'm a huge proponent of. I have been from the beginning of marketing tea. I never felt like I needed an office space to make that happen. Um, mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden we have to do that as a company. Um, we've been we've been pushing for food delivery services and and restaurants using touch screens to do everything and and robots to make all your food. Okay, so so when we quiet everything down and everybody has to go home for a minute, I think that these are those major moments where those things can really take a turn. I, the college students sitting at home right now who can't be in class, which arguably going to college is a big part of the experience, have to get creative enough to make those experiences within their hometown or currently make them at least online. But until their college open backs up, opens back up, they have to make their own interpersonal connections. And they'll start to wonder, why am I paying huge amounts of tuition for something that can be done online and then I can spend time with my family and friends. I, I just think it's major. I, I, I'm really, um, I can't stop thinking about this. Am I the only one thinking about this? Am I, am I just going too far? Uh, well, it could be a family trait <laughs> because I do too. I, I think you're touching on some things that I really hadn't thought too much about. Um, but I, I, the, the theme of the college experience, I mean, you hear so many people that say the college experience is, you know, that's why I'm going over to this school miles and miles away. Um, and that's why parents will actually pay for it. Um, and the college experience just means I'm going to be free and I can go out and party. I, I, I'm probably, that's, that's probably not how most people view it. Well, I mean, there's a, what was a your, large part of I it. I mean, you went to college closer to home. Um, yeah. I went close enough, but I also lived on campus for most of it because I am that kind of free spirit. I wanted to be able to be there and immerse. And I think that that was incredibly valuable. Um, but not for all the, not, not for the tuition that I paid. Exactly. That, you know, like, yeah. was it really worth that when, when let's say instead the, the journey as a young adult is okay, it's, it's time to move out. It's, it's a good moment. Grab an apartment with some roommates, some, some close friends, form your own social circles, um, yeah. create your own social experiences, do what you need to do. And that would include partying too. I think that's probably a part of it, that age in life. And, but, but why then have have uh, education be a component of that? Why not just do your classes from your computer like you have been for the last three months because it's been mandated anyways at much lower prices because we don't have to have stupid university overhead. Um, yeah. yeah, I think I just that think it's going to shift the mindset for a lot of people. It'll be it'll be traumatic. There's, I mean, there's obviously large institutions at stake here. Um, in uh, actually in Central Illinois, I just saw this morning McMurray College, which is a longtime private college, just closed its doors. I mean, it, I'm sure the coronavirus is what sort of precipitated it immediately. But uh, I don't know what happens to all these state-run universities. And, you know, we come, you and I, from a state that is looking like it might go bankrupt, whatever that means. Um, He's talking so about it, Illinois, by the way. Yeah, thank you, Illinois. And I don't, I don't know that uh, institutions are going to give it up that easily. They got a lot of buildings they're continuing to build. Um, but you're right, I, I do. I, I, I am fascinated by that, the, the technology. I mean, because... Pandemics have always been a possibility, and of course they've happened from time to time. It's like this is the first one, but uh, uniquely, given that we are kind of overpopulating the world, um, we are more prone to being susceptible to it now than ever, right? But we are, for the first time ever, emerging into this world where we can do what we're doing working from home. And, um, you know, I've said this to you, that I'm, I'm here with my, my lovely wife and daughter. We moved up because we can um, for those of you who, who don't know that I shouldn't address your audience directly. Um, for those of you who <laughs> you don't, <laughs> hey, Tyler's audience, which, which you just said was just me. So that, um, anyway, I, got, I think I got a few listeners. We're doing okay. I hope so. Well, actually I hope not on this one, but on the other one. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, we, we have been working from home. Um, your sister Catherine was going into a really awesome job at Purdue and, uh, that, that that's kind of a new thing, but, she's now ordered to work from home. And guess what? Everything she was doing is she's quite capable of doing it from home. We've, we've got the room, we've got her set up in an office. Your mother and I are in separate offices. Um, but she and I had been doing that for a long time. And when you, when they gated down the company that I work for, because I'm the one of the people that does it from a distance, it impacted me pretty much zero. I have great concern for, you know, my, my staff who normally was reporting to an office. Uh, I'm proud to say that uh, there's about five people in our Illinois office. They're reporting from work. And I often forget that that's what they're doing because 
the work hasn't changed. Our ability to tap into our servers, high-speed connections, because we're transferring a lot of files, uh, to communicate with each other uh, over Skype, that's our preferred method, share screens uh, live whenever the heck we feel like it, and preserving all of our conversations in ways that when you're in the office and you're having these conversations, you walk up to someone's cubicle and you agree that they're going to do this and that, and then you walk away and they, they you know, totally do something different, uh, you have no recourse. When we're these days, we're communicating really quickly in Skype, and sometimes we use audio, so it's irrelevant. But a lot of times, we're throwing around message traffic that you can back up, and we do it to each other all the time. Actually, my staff does it to me <laughs> more than anything. So you ask them a question they already answered two days ago, and they'll humiliate you and say, <laughs> you know, here it is. Like, you answered this two days ago, idiot. Yeah, it's and one of my favorite things up, when, you know? when you have to, I bet you do frustrate people too, because I know you, and uh, <laughs> I, you. I'd be the one sending you the message that says, as mentioned above um. yeah, you're one of, yeah and you're one of those people you know what i have i have and i welcome him to do it and, I, and and this is a good thing i mean keeps the manager honest too frankly i mean that's that's where you see that happening more than anywhere else is is you'll have somebody who's in a leadership position who double talks and you can you can passive aggressively shut them down okay i'm going down a rabbit hole the, the point no, but, is yes yeah. i believe the technology um, has uniquely enabled us to deal with a situation like this. I mean, we're still screwed. Don't get me wrong. I, I've seen the unemployment numbers that, that right now they're even larger than predicted. And there are things like, you know, just the food supply chain and all of that. Um, the, the human touch is going to be needed. But we do have some unique abilities to keep things running. Um, that, that is just, it's amazing. And I, yeah. I to keep... You know, the danger of podcasts, as you know, is is you say something now and two weeks later, it makes you look dumb. Um, you and I, we know that right now there's still, we're still unclear as to what like the death toll might be out of this thing. We There's a lot of reasons now to think that um, the, the communist Chinese government is lying about, you know, their current um, number of people affected as well as their death toll. We don't know. Um, so, but I will say that once we get past this, um, and I know you to be a compassionate person. This this has potential to bring great sadness to everybody, and that doesn't change what we're talking about right now. But I'm not going to start, you know, celebrating the new paradigms until we've buried the dead, and I'm hoping that nobody I love is among them. And um, you, you know that it's, it's but I, I like that we're talking about this. It's I mean, fair. But, it's fair. It's also dark. My point was more. Um, I, I think my point is sort of. Because because I am an optimist, and so I try to see the the good side of of anything that's happening, and and there's obviously a really sad and rough bad side to this. But I yeah. I think that some of the things that will change are, particularly I'm thinking about people who rely personally on a on a on a work environment. They somehow need that in their lives or feel that they do, who are now forced to recognize um, the possibilities of working from home. And I'm someone who loves freedom. So I've always been inclined to work at home because I like to be able to set my own schedule. If I want to go bake some bread now and then work later, that's what I'm going to do. Um, I, I have to believe in people that they will see that as an opportunity and see that moment and start to feel I don't know some of the some of the benefit of what I've been able to feel, and and they still sort of I don't know I guess just rely on that on yeah. that office environment. Um, well, and a, and a small business sort of Darwinism too that that uh, the small businesses now are going to retool many of them that, that and survive even, and new ones that are going it, to emerge. It's not even necessarily for small businesses either. Like I I'll, I'll even go further than that and say I. I am outspoken. I, I'm. I guess I. I don't fall in line with a lot of people my age. Uh, in that, I actually love the free market. I think as a as a concept, it can, it can, it can absolutely work in so many ways. And, um, I think moments like this define who can who can last in the market and who can adapt and who cannot. And I think those that cannot don't really deserve a place to play. Past that, um. Because at, at at any business's core is just the ability to adapt. Um, that that's what it is. Where it's an institution of people that can adapt. So so I'm not. I don't necessarily know that I'm going to feel all that bad for universities who are unable to adapt and recognize what's changing in the world uh, as this goes on. I just won't feel that bad about it. I think that that's what the market's supposed to do. Full full disclosure. Um... <laughs> Your mother, your sister, and I all work in online education. I mean, you're about, yeah, you're on the adaptive edge of it. We seem to be. Uh, your sister, in particular, is working for an institution that was already, I, I think, was on the cutting edge of trying to, 
you know, find those new ways to to present university content online. I mean, that's that's exactly what her job is all about right now. And all of a sudden, it's like you are uniquely uh, important in the world right now because you you are part of that shift. And um, so that that's that's an interesting position to be in. Also, I think my point about small business, you know, just the like I say, the Darwinism of it is they, they are, I mean, my company now too is, is I'm sure the same, but they're going to retool. Everybody's going to start asking the question, all right, next time this happens, you know, what do we do to immunize ourselves? Wrong word. Um, you know, f- how do we make our business viable? Even airlines uh, are going to have to address how they invest their money. I, I'm acting like I know what the heck I'm talking about, but it's interesting to me that, you know, because my mind immediately goes to, well, how's an airline going to change? They always have to move a whole lot of people who sit close to each other. They're going to, you're probably, I imagine you're going to see some new measures that, especially in free enterprise, these companies are going to be advertising them and showing how safe we are. Wouldn't um, you love that, by the way? Like a, yeah, like it wouldn't bother as, me a bit. <laughs> as two men who are both six foot four, luckily oh. I was able to get there in my life. Um, we, I, I would love a, a, a six foot seat a six foot area on a plane. Gosh, that'd yeah, be lovely. Yeah. International flights, right. And, and, and <laughs> some kind of barrier, maybe I, I don't know. stretch like, it out. Just take oh, it easy at yeah. the same time. You know what, you know what actually concerns me from the other end of this, just to get even weirder on the natural health point is that, um, the, the reliance on antibacterial and fighting bacteria is something that I'm so afraid of for humans because I, and, and the same goes for antibiotics that we misuse, use totally irresponsibly. I love antibiotics. Like that has got to be the, the best thing that Western medicine ever brought into the world for sure. I'm all aboard. However, when we start to abuse both antibiotics and antibacterial technology at the same time, that's when we get freaking super viruses. That's right. when it happens. Resistant and so, strains and all that. Right. Oh gosh. So yeah. And I, you know, I, I've been made fun of within our, our family for, um, my position on, on, um, not using antibacterial soap and, and, and things like that. Although I'm quite hygienic, I actually love bacteria. There's a whole, if anybody wants to really get into this, go listen to the sourdough episode where we talked about how great bacteria is and how your body is made of quite literally 10 times more bacteria cells than human cells. And I just think that should sink in for every single person. Like you are more bacteria than you are human. Um, mm-hmm. That blows my mind every time. Yeah, me too. Um, I learned that from you uh, shortly ago and it's, it's, it's been messing with me. It is. Like, it's crazy. Cause then you, then you see this thing that says antibacterial and you're just going to rub that all over your body. Like <laughs> indiscriminately because that bacteria so does much a lot about of what's things. going wrong with me lately. Yeah. Well, it, it's so linked up with your immune system. Luckily, the science is finally catching up on this. And now we're talking about how, you know, probiotics can make your immune system better and, and also can make you less depressed. That's a genuine connection that's been found. And it's like, yeah. oh, yeah, really? So when we support the thing that's more us than us, um, we actually function better? Yeah. So, but I I don't know. I, I'm so going down this rabbit hole with you. I'm going to switch. I'm going to switch our topic entirely. Good. I was getting depressed. I will yeah, say though that uh, someday I'm going to go to Las Cruces and have kind bread sourdough because I followed them after your podcast and it does look pretty yummy. And you you are trying to make your own sourdough and are foiled <laughs> by the grocery store yes. right now, aren't I you? I am. Every time I, I sneak in there and I'm holding my breath and I go and the it's strangely a lot of people decided that flour was something to hoard. So I can't get my bread flour or my wheat flour, um, but I'll I'll be ready when it comes back. Andrea sent me a, an article just the other day. Let me go see. Um, from Washington Post that people are baking bread in massive numbers. That and makes we're, sense. We're running out of flour and yeast. Um, I just wish I could turn everybody on to sourdough because you wouldn't really need yeast if you just put it, just a little extra effort in there. Mm. And it's better for you. There you go. We still need that flour. Yeah, yeah I that actually, that. that's I, I shouldn't say hoarding. I mean, that's actually encouraging. I, I I was able to find bread loaves at the grocery store, but you've taught me not to eat them. Uh, but, but the flour's gone, so maybe this is a good thing. You can uh, eat them. Just look at the ingredients first and find yeah. how they've how they've removed all the nutrition from the flour first, and then re enriched it back yeah. in. That's so incredible, actually. I love I I learned so much about the history of of wheat and how we take out all of the the nutrients from from wheat flour or or, or any type of flour made from wheat. And then um, we 
realized that that was making us sick, and so then we uh, sold them back in there as vitamins into <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Put it back in and inject <laughs> so, it with a needle. <laughs> and this is one of those moments where I have to laugh at the free market, and I'll laugh at it just like anybody else because we we created two separate industries um, that can thrive uh, because it's better to just separate them for some reason. Oh, well, there's, there's your silver lining then. And there's usually like canola oil and all sorts of weird things in your and preservatives in your in your store bought breads that I mean yeah. bread should not last for like two weeks on shelf that's messed up yeah it give it yeah, I mean it's it, a good point sourdough can last like a week uh a week but it also like past day two it it starts to get kind of stale you definitely have to toast it um yeah. but sourdough even has that advantage of having a really crispy outside crust um that helps it stay helps it keep from getting stale and, and molding but yeah, okay. yeah um anyway so so yeah bacteria is that what the main point was bacteria is the future i i don't that i am bacteria i think that was the, a will smith movie i am bacteria. that's a good one it's not oh, what yeah. the movie was called have yeah. you seen that movie i am legend yes i can't stop thinking about it when when we rushed out potential coronavirus cures and i'm all on board and i think well wait a minute what if <laughs> oh right because that was a it was a an immunization wasn't it it was yeah oh that's way scarier yeah, I, you know, it drives the paranoia. No, I like shifting gears. I think this is a great idea. Give me some lighter. Also, <laughs> it's also the main, I think it's in V for Vendetta that the government created virus and then the cure actually hurt people or something like that too. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so the thing I, the, the other thing I wrote on my list, I'm going to, this is such a, there's no segue to this. Um, but last night I was, so Andrew and I love watching stand-up comedy. We'll watch all the different ones. I think in particular, Netflix puts out such great ones. Um, and I was trying to think of the best comedian line for line of, of all time. And I definitely, a few popped into my head. I think Anthony Jeselnik, if you can, if you can handle it, um, has line for line, some of the funniest things ever said. Mm -hmm. Also, um, James Acaster, who I think he's he's a genius. Right, right. But the one who, who still, I think takes the cake here is Steve Martin. And I was thinking about how Steve Martin was such a big part of my upbringing and likely... Mm -hmm a huge part of how I developed any sort of sense of humor. Um, and I still will just in random moments, just whip out a Steve Martin quote that can still floor me or, or Andrea because it's so genius. But, um, he, he was coming up when you were how old you must've been like in high school when he was, I'm going to say 10 and 11. Um, I know that, uh, you know, he used to, I, I've seen YouTube videos marked 1978, 1979 um, recently. And I, I've, I, you know, I love Steve Martin. I idolize the man, not as a person. I don't know him as a person, but he's all about delivery. But um, in the middle, of, and I, I don't even take this back to the coronavirus, but his contribution to coronavirus was he just went outside and had a camera set up and he played the banjo for about two minutes, just standing there being Steve Martin. Um, and it just made me feel awesome. I don't know why. I love his transition into being an old man. It's, I, it's me too. It's so classy. He's he's, he's been so yeah. classy about it, and he's like, you know, I'm I'm less about the comedy. I'm a little more about just playing the banjo and having a good time now. Yeah, as a child, uh, so there we are. I'm ten and eleven years old, probably, and you know, we have these things called LPs, vinyl records, um, and he had about three of them. Listened to them over and over and over and over and over, and even subconsciously, I'm sure they shaped you know, some of my attempts to deliver humor or, or just sometimes when I'm talking, I think probably there's a lot of that that crept in. I, I, there's just something about the way he delivered comedy back in the day and even his movies that aren't so hot. He just always seems to be an appealing, he does have some movies that aren't so hot. He seems to just be an appealing character. Um, and uh, yeah, so you, you got exposed to him a little bit as a kid just because I couldn't stop listening to that stuff. You made, <laughs> I remembering now, you made uh, a, um, those LPs and you specifically went in and, and cut out, you know, any swearing. You were um, too young for the swearing, but you were totally, in my opinion, but you were totally sophisticated enough to get every little piece of humor from a very early age um, that he delivered. Cause it, you know, it was fairly accessible anyway, but the stuff, yeah, I, I remember doing that for, he's like, I, Tyler has to hear uh, Steve Martin, but I'm not going to be the parent that exposes him to some of the cuss words, you know, the, 
<laughs> Never mind. I'm not going to go into them. Um, but uh, do you want to yeah. list them? Because I do. That I love them you. all now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're all good. But um, but I I think of of him as kind of one of those things that as a kid you definitely exposed me to. That um, there's a there's a solid list of things I think you put into my world that that. I, I didn't even have to like them. It was never about whether or not I liked them, but I think it was like you teaching me quality um, and what, what quality is and what makes it. And so there's Steve Martin, there's Rush, there's Talking Heads. It's a lot of, there was a lot of music um, as Tom a kid. Petty. Tom, Tom Petty. Petty, yeah. 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 So you're, you're hitting my big list of three right there. Yeah. Yeah. Man, thank you. That I'm, I mean, I don't know. It, it, the, the jury is never out about your parenting, but I just love hearing you say that. Um, well, I think that it was kind of cool because then as I was developing my own music tastes, I was able to bring you different things. And I was like, I, you've been able to explain quality to me. I believe this is quality. And I, and you've generally liked all the artists that I've been able to share with you too. And we, we went and, um, we've gone to two shins concerts now. Cause I just love the shins. And I think yeah. better music may, may never have been written. Certainly better lyrics may never have been written ever. Um, much. yeah. Yeah, it, it, I love that. And we went to two Rush concerts. Isn't that strange? Whoa. Indianapolis yeah. and Salt Lake City. Yeah. With Sadly. your lovely then girlfriend, now wife. Yeah. yeah. Was, I don't know, get me started just, on that. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, well, now I have to tell people what it is now. I can't just yeah. set it aside, which is obviously that. Um, which month did this happen in? It was just recently. Uh, it was. I, it was February, wasn't it? February. We yeah, lost it was February. The... And we didn't find out about it for about 10 days. Uh, until the family had had the chance to do their part. Lost the yeah. greatest drummer rock has ever known. Yeah. Yeah. And an interesting person as well. Yeah. Another yeah. great book, Ghostwriter. Yep. Um, it, it is. I, and, and I think I, I'm going to not, not now, but I'm going to go back and give that book a read slash listen again in, in kind of the new context, because I think some of it will hold up really well in terms of his sort of universality, I guess. Um, but yeah, that, okay, so that's, those are two issues that are kind of prevalent in my life right now, that in a short amount of time, uh, we lost Tom Petty, and we lost Neil Peart, um, and, and I'm just one of those people that I relate to my celebrities, this is, I don't think I'm unique in that, that when I listen to music that gives me joy, I'm imagining the person behind it, and especially with Tom Petty, I mean, there's so much of Tom Petty in Tom Petty music, and and then when he passes away, there's a macabre you know, death veil over stuff that used to just bring me such great joy. Music that has been part of my heart, you know, from when I was an eighth grader with an eight track player and going to uh, a lake with my brother, that kind of stuff, you know, and, and now it's like you just, and in his case, he didn't really die of old age. It was very tragic and avoidable. And um, I feel I relate to music so hard sometimes that that it's none of my dang business. I'm not his family member, but it still leaves a hole. It's really weird. And I had been saying to myself, self, for a long time that like if anybody from Rush passed away, this this real staple of my music stuff that I listen to to get past stress, um, you know, that I really, really connect with is going to have that sort of a same veil over it. And that's going to be a shitty day. Um, mm -hmm. And sure enough, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it, and it's it, not to make myself as a fan self important, but I, it's interesting to me that um, I think a lot of people from my generation relate to their their rock stars that way um many of them were just selling a product but i just feel like you know music connected with us at a very real level back then um and that's this is the downside of it you know it's just like the the people that you that that was the music of your youth when those makers of the music of your youth start to pass away it makes you feel pretty dang old and uh, a lot of the escapism in your music just has a little tint on it now um, thank you for that. I hope I've depressed well, we, everybody. No, but I, I was thinking that we had such a nice sort of full circle moment there, actually, because after Tom Petty died, probably within a month of that, I would say, we went to a Shins concert in St. Louis. It was yes. um, for their most recent album, Heartworms. And uh, oh. they're, they're one of the final, uh, maybe, no, the final song of the set, they start playing Sleeping Lessons, which is an incredible song. And all of a sudden it just merges and you hear the song change and they're playing American Girl by Tom Petty. That was weird. And it was I, a, it was it a was really beautiful. excellent tribute. And it was cool because, you know, you've, you introduced me to Tom Petty. I introduced you to the Shins. We're at this concert and we have this Tom Petty tribute. And it's like, 
you know, picking up the flag almost, which was it is. And, and there are, I don't think there are many people who could, who could do that. That gave me such delight. And I got chills right now, literally, as you mentioned that, that there I am standing with you and you and I connect and, and we know, you know, kind of why we, I mean, you, you have an appreciation for Tom Putty, but you also know like what he meant to me. It's, yeah. And, and James Mercer is uh, worthy. <laughs> in right. My opinion, right. Um, and it I'm was, it pop- was, it was in we'll the go, moment too. It wasn't, it wasn't, um, it was, it came out of nowhere. It, it yeah. hit me like a ton of bricks and it was perfect. And it was a beautiful tribute and it wasn't self aggrandizing. And it was just, I, it was, I think an artist, you know, nodding to another artist in a, in a really meaningful way. I love that moment. That's so that's one of those life moments. It's, I know we're just standing in a rock concert, but there I was with you and yours. And, uh, that, that was tremendous. Yeah, it was that was tremendous. I thanks for bringing that. I'd kind of forgotten about that, which is which is crazy. Um, I just watched. The reason yeah. I remember is because I just was, you know, you know, every now and then, maybe I'm the only one who does this. I'll just like find myself in my camera roll on my phone, just going way back, just like, oh yeah, I remember that. That was a nice day, you know. Um, and that that one happened to pop up, and I I just watched that through, and I was like, oh man, that was so cool when that happened. But um, music is a big one for you. I you you listened and probably still do listen to quite a bit more music than me. I sometimes can't get myself to listen to music. I think, um, I'm, I don't, I don't entirely know why I'd share if I did. It's like, sometimes it can be hard for me to, to lock in and listen to music, but I, I, I'll always pick up a book. Um, I'm always good with, with reading anything or listening to a podcast or listening to an audiobook. That's cool with me, but music's just hard to access. Cause I think I have to really be in the right place for it. Cause I think, um, it hits me, you know, and I can't just have that all day long. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like I can't drink all day long. You know, that's that's it's not true. Be I, I, yeah, it, that's true. I, I think it, it goes well uh, in the earbuds when you're running, if you do it safely. Um, and it, it just it, it does a lot there. I, I love it when I'm driving, obviously. Um, and uh, there are other times when I just it just helps. You know, I, I, I'm not a person that like I'm not going through life in misery and I need escape all the time. I'm actually I freaking love life. Um, but, uh, I, I get, I get to a point where I just have to hear a particular song or I just get on a zone listening to a particular band for a while. And I, I hate not having music in my head. Um, and sometimes the wrong songs get in my head and I need the right songs to drive them away. You know, right. So that helps. You, you, you um, I, I, I try to picture sort of when you, when you got into music on your own and I feel like, was, was that like a defining thing for you that you could pick your music? You have, you have two brothers who are close to you in age of whom you are the youngest. And so there's a certain amount of defining your personality that comes from being the youngest sibling that I can certainly attest to and finding the thing that, that you get that maybe other people don't get to, um, was that sort of that pathway for you? Was that you were finding the music? Were you the hipster into the new bands, introducing them to people? Uh, combinations of things there. Uh, this is kind of um, <laughs> some some navel navel gazing going on now. Um, but uh, my my oldest brother, the aforementioned one, uh, exposed me to some some good music at a young age, and and some stuff that didn't catch on with me at first. Uh, the police was always. He had the room down in the basement, and the police was heavy on bass, and he had this little console player that just rocked the wall up, and the redundant bass lines on some of those early police albums. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that's not the way to get started on the police. Anyway, but um, I, I think it was probably him who introduced me to Pink Floyd, and so there, I'm, I'm at a dock in the middle of the night on Kentucky Lake with this old, not stereo, radio thing listening to the wall for the first two, three, and four times. Um and and that's where I'm like, oh, you know, I, I I definitely had music appreciation, but I getting out on my own and experiencing and figuring out what it was I liked liked, uh, kind of started right there. And I I honestly I developed a thirst at that point. Um, now back then, nothing was streaming, kids, and um, we had you know our, our local library. You could go get LPs, and a lot of times cover art would be what would attract you. Strangely enough. Um, because there was a lot, I had a lot of ignorance about what bands were what. So I listened to a lot of different stuff and some connected and some didn't um, like that. But that, I think that there was a point you could put 1978, I think right on it. I think that's when the wall came out. Um, so it had been around that time. And uh, yeah, it was just, it was just like a switch had been flipped. I, this is funny. I'm talking about my musical influences. Like it matters, 
but, but you asked, so there. Um, yeah, that's I discovered Rush similarly. I mean, I just saw a little Rush video, and I don't think I even knew what Tom Sawyer was. The first Rush song I ever heard was, uh, uh, give me a minute, it's off of Grace Under Pressure, and um, 1001001 SOS, you know that song. Um, Not as well as you. Uh, it's one of those songs where the title isn't actually in the uh, lyrics, which makes it hard. Do you mean to pull um, it up? No, it's fine. I'll get to it. I'll, I'm, I'm going to shout it out in the middle of, a, of an unrelated topic. Um, but there I, I, there I found my way to the Urbana Free Library where I had a card and grabbed a Rush album. And then that was it. I don't think I, there was probably not a week went by when I didn't listen to Rush. There may not have been since that time. <laughs> So thanks. This has been good therapy talking about Rush. But I'm gonna yeah. go find it anyways. Um, oh, it's it's sad right now. Neil would kick me if he knew that I couldn't remember. How far name. into the album are we talking? Which track? I believe that would be the track two on a uh, track one on side two, which means nothing to this generation. The body electric. The body electric. Within. Thank you very much. The body, yeah, electric. body electric. See, and this is a guy who was into to Ayn Rand and everything, and I believe that's a reference. that's uh, that's 1984. Dog on it. Okay, George Orwell yeah. then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think actually a power of moving pictures and, and Tom Sawyer and all that stuff is the Rand tribute stuff that Neil Peart used to do. I thought that was mostly twenty one twelve. Uh, man, that, that one really is twenty one twelve. Is I thought Tom Sawyer was something left over from it. But you're, you're right. probably right. You're probably right. Here I am. I'm professing my love for Rush and just blowing it, not remembering the Bobby <laughs> Electric, the very first Rush song. But this was this was something that okay. So um, I, I've as you know, I read too many books, just too many books. Um, some which I love, some which I don't love. Um, the one I I picked up lately was um, it's called Twelve Rules for Life: An Antidote to Chaos, and it's by a guy named Jordan Peterson. I think I sent you his um, his podcast too. But um, he he's got some out there views. I totally don't agree with about. 30% of what he says in this book, but there's a good chunk of it. And there's a whole chapter on raising kids. And uh, it's a really thought provoking chapter. He really talks about kind of like what kids need. And I feel like for me, all I needed was sort of exposure to good things uh, in order to be able to recognize, I don't know, it's, I'm trying to put my finger on it. I can't quite, but it's sort of like if you, if you, it's not just that you would play me music. It was that you would tell me like, here's all the craftsmanship that goes into this music. Um, and that was what locked in, and then I can... So so now it's not just that Andrew and I will be listening to music, or I'll show her a band that I really like for whatever reason. It's like, it's like here's the reasons why this blows my mind, and I can really get into them. And part of that's a background in music, too. Um, and yeah. part of it's just that from a young age, that was expected. It's like, it's like I remember I can I, I used to play you music, too, when I was younger, and I, I tried to tell you why I thought it was really good, and you'd be like, no, that's, that's not good. And that's fine. And then you let me have my own opinion, so it wasn't like you were ever trying to control me, but... It, it's true. The artists that I listen to the most are the ones where I was like, okay, here's something that's really, I've got something solid here that uh, <laughs> has these aspects of genuine musical craftsmanship. Um, I, can't, I can't think of an example of that. You fascinate You know, me. I think when I was younger, um, I, I remember when like the first Kid Cudi album came out and you've never been much one for hip hop anyway, but yeah. I played you some of it and you were like, eh, okay. And it's true. I mean, I, I don't, find myself listening to that ever 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 um but there are other artists i share with you so like the, the shins or band of horses or different things mm -hmm. at that same time or even keen who i yeah. love um Fantastic. and andrea andrea loves now who i will still pick up and listen to consistently and yeah. so part of that was just you know that i was enjoying listening to the music of the of the time and that's always there's something to be said for that but at the end of the day you what who you return to are the artists that are really crafts crafts people at what they do um, hands down, every time. I think so. Yeah, and that's who and, keeps putting out good music too. And and it's harder to find now, I think, than it was back then. I I don't know if that's true. I you know, I like to quote other people, especially when I because I forget them within a couple of days. But back to Billy Corgan, his conversation with Joe Rogan, they were in agreement that you know pop is porn, and and so much of what is coming out in the music industry now is just giving people what sort of quote, gets them off. And that's not true of all music, or even probably of all of pop. But I think that is something that stifles, or for some reason, I, I don't know, but I, I feel like I feel like we're not seeing a lot of stuff that really is substantive or somebody who's really trying to self-express and, and really bring out artistry. 
so much music now. The, the instrumental portions of music are, oh man, I sound like an old man. How, why am I doing this? All right. Um, they're pre-recorded. There's not a, that virtuoso thing, like with Rush, I'm sorry. You know, a, a bit where what I'm hearing is a performance and someone is, is not only showing their songwriting and, and how sounds mixed together, but I'm also hearing, you know, this great skill of performance. And nowadays, that's all pre-tracked, you know, and it, there's some skill of composition, no doubt, but there's so little to, to, to soak in and appreciate about someone's actual musical abilities with pop music. And I, I mean, I keep listening and I keep trying, but I, I'm sure it's out there. Um, but without you, Mr. Hickson Jr., I, I don't know that I would have found a heck of a lot. I mean, the, I'm finding in, in sort of the alternative, less well-known things like the Shins, um, and band of horses and and other places. I mean, there were there were times when I would just, hey Tyler, what's good now? <laughs> you know, recently, not like you said when you were younger and Kid Cudi and all that. But um, so <laughs> and you, no disrespect to Kid Cudi too. Yeah, it, no, no, no disrespect. I'm sure he's great. It was good um, stuff. Didn't catch. He was me. moderate enough to to help me enjoy hip hop because yeah. I wasn't raised on a lot of hip hop. Yeah. Um, what's that? What's I that person really you got me into? That uh, did, did uh, I've still got it. I just can't think of it. He's got the Illinois album. Oh yeah, so I just introduced you to Sufjan Stevens, and that album yes. came out in like '08 or something. But yeah. I think of it a lot. And uh, but yeah, that's like it's it's craftsmanship versus sort of I don't know maybe versus even collaboration. Can I say yeah. that and be right potentially? So you can go to IKEA and see like a bookshelf, and it's like wow, that's actually kind of a beautiful piece of art. But yeah. uh, it was designed by 20 people and then tested in front of X number of people and then mass manufactured. Um, as opposed to a similar bookshelf made by a local craftsman who showed a skill in all these different areas in, in design and in working. With, and of course I, I had uh, Ford on an episode of the podcast who talked to me some about woodworking. And so yeah, he was cool. There's a difference. There's, there's something to be valued when, especially when one person can show uh, this whole myriad of skills. Um, I think that's, that is one thing that draws me to music, but Hey, as long as people are listening to music, they're not doing other uh, bad human things. <laughs> so, like, listen to whatever music you want. Ultimately, I, yeah, music okay. makes people happy. So, as long as it's something that makes you happy, and and especially, I think as long as it's not what you're listening to because you you feel like you have to, or you feel like to fit in, you need to listen to this type of thing. Right. Um, you know, as long as it is what reflects what you're feeling, then yeah, that's, that's the great. thing, man. And this this from the from our three years in Orlando, I think so many people's musical tastes right now. This is great. You really need to cut me off because. I'm getting old Manny on you right now, but so so much of what you hear driving by you with subwoofers on on the streets is tailored to be loud on subwoofers on the streets, and right. and there's no way the person sitting in that car, in my opinion, is is really enjoying that music for its own quality as much as I want to make sure people hear me listening to this music. It, it just seems to me. I like think that, that that's true. It's it's, it's true in terms of how you listen to your music too. I mean, yeah. you'll never have as good of an experience listening to music on speakers that are so loud that even you can't hear what's going on right um as opposed to like a really decent pair of headphones cranked up to a point um yeah. but but it's an interesting it's an interesting thought kind of as to who can really dictate who who gets to enjoy their art form in whatever way they get to enjoy it because sometimes it can be fun to listen to your music nice and loud um but what I think is even more cool is if you're listening to music really loud, sort of in your car driving through a town or whatever, it should definitely reflect that moment. It should definitely, at the very least, kind of be like not an intrusion into the environment, yeah. but something that adds to that, that environment. Like I have I have bands that I'll listen to and it's like, this is nighttime driving music. And it's just like, I think you just got to, you, you totally have to. Well, well, if you I feel like to me, if you're listening to music in a, in a really solid way, it's about reflecting how you feel in any particular moment so you gotta you have to pause first and say like how am i feeling and then that's what kind of determines who you're going to go listen to and if it's anything else that's determining what you're listening to i, I don't really know why you'd bother listening to music yeah thank you yeah it, it's free country you know so i i i'm, I'm not and i think i'm, I'm not going to pretend to get in other people's heads uh, too much um and so it's just conjecture what i said about subwoofers it just seems to me like well Whatever you that is you're listening to, I think that was a product that was created for subwoofers. <laughs> right. You. The only thing is you miss out sometimes on really good hip-hop because you don't necessarily like hip-hop, but yeah. you'd have missed out on Frank Ocean, who I love, uh, mm. and who else can I can I think of that's just like a really, really... Oh, Childish Gambino. Mm -hmm. uh, 
there's there's hip hop artists out there that that uh, if you if you enjoyed hip hop at all, you would have a hard time telling me that's not quality. <laughs> too many people that give it props for me to say there's just nothing there. So I will Absolutely. I'll just leave it at and I, and I'll give it a try every now and then. In but we can to... come down hard on country music. I think um, I've I've heard some mm. very very weird country music songs that are the exact same way. They're designed to tailor yeah a, a th- maybe a thought process or like express political views for no apparent reason oh some of it is so formulaic yes yeah there's other that's... stuff that uh, I, I i'm i'm hard pressed right now but there is some stuff that came out of country i haven't heard anything lately i'm sure it's out there that was actually meaningful and and good stuff and not quite so crass but if i listen to country radio much anymore and i'll pick up that new song and you can just I can predict the next lyric a lot of the times. So I'm like, okay, no, there's come a great, on, guys. There's a really, really solid satirical moment in uh, Parks and Recreation where Bo Burnham has a little guest spot, and he's a, an artist that, that um, Leslie Nope is trying to, to get to come to their show or something, and he he's a country music artist, and, and his song is something about, like, it's it's basically any, any um, trope of country music you could throw all into one song. And it's sort of like support the troops and have a beer and love your mom all <laughs> just in one song. <laughs> it, just, it makes absolutely no sense. It's incredible. It's I a like good, it. it's a good skewer. But hey, skewer my music too. You know, like anybody could come at the shins and be like, "This is some depressing shit." And I, I think you'd be fair in saying so. But I also like depressing music. So yeah, yeah, it it's it got is. its place. It has its place. <laughs> but um, okay, so th- th- this was this was a, a good line. The only other thing I was. Um, thinking of in the same line as I thought of Steve Martin I thought of the other person who I have consistently seen you admire from a standpoint of a a quality comedian and that was Brian Cranston uh who popped into my head because you as a kid I watched Malcolm in the Middle which wasn't really on when I was a kid I think I was just a, a little bit too young for it but you would show it to me yeah. uh and of course when Breaking Bad came out we watched that together we watched nearly that whole series together you moved away um, what were you thinking i know i had to i had to i guess i graduated and moved away i yeah. it was what it was but um that was the other person i was thinking of who i, I always give constant props to when they come on i think that's because you saw them early on and pointed them out to me <laughs> i love it when i feel like i've discovered something early you know but right. you can't say you liked brian cranston before he was cool but um because i was as surprised as anybody of what a, an amazing dramatic actor that he was but I absolutely love the manic character Hal in uh, Malcolm in the Middle. That just everything that came out of that man's mouth was so in character and genius that I, I love that you latched onto him too. Um, that was some good stuff. <laughs> Let me ask you about something that's that's new that's not from my world because um, so so growing up you you were obviously a a a, a very philanthropic person. Um, Overall, you were generous with your time. You were volunteering for lots of things. You, um, you consistently would would uh, coach a soccer team or record a school performance or whatever it might have been. And sort of later on, there was a connection that happened with um, with Make a Wish in particular. I remember that you would you would you know tape a school play and then people could buy the DVD and the proceeds. I think were going to to either the program, and then I think they went to Make-A-Wish at some point, like later on, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then you started the um, the Allerton Half Marathon. No, the Allerton Marathon. 2013, Mar- it... yeah. Allerton Trails Half Marathon. Now we just the call half it Allerton Races, but yeah. Right. Um, at a certain point, and obviously Allerton Park, if, if anybody finds themselves in rural Illinois, is just a gem in the middle of the cornfields. I've, so I, there's cool. no way to describe this place. I haven't... I have now been traveling for uh, seven months and did quite a bit of traveling before. Is it seven months? Does that sound right? Uh, I think you're at eight by now. Yeah, coming into, I guess, eight. Um, Full time and then did a ton of traveling before that. I love going to my local parks wherever we're staying or wherever I've been traveling to. I have yet to find something uh, that that has a whatever quality it is that Allerton Park has. Um, So you kind of fuse that love of Allerton with the love of running and I, I'm curious about the philanthropic side of it, too, because that race is there to proceeds benefit um, Make-A-Wish. And yeah. where, where did Make-A-Wish come from, though? Because that's, that's something in my history of, of knowing you that I don't actually know where that came from. 
Oh, you don't? Okay. I didn't have leukemia, so there's not a personal <laughs> Was <it you>? connection there. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're awesome to bring that up. And if anybody is interested in it, this is an ongoing. And thanks for what you said, by the way. I wasn't I wasn't all that philanthropic when I was younger, but I, I just I did get tuned into this thing, and it's call it a midlife crisis that's channeled in a very good direction. I, that's what I like to think of it as, um, extra energy on my hands or whatever. But um, you know, I did know a family. I still know them uh, that lived uh, near us in central Illinois. I worked with them, and they had a child who um, I want to say who is about four, and uh, had a, a fairly rare and really dangerous form of uh, leukemia um, that was discovered. And then they spent the next, I don't know, two or three years doing various chemotherapies and all kinds of things, just, you know, the, all the horrible things you hear about. And um, I really didn't know that much about their situation at the time, but they were nominated and granted a wish trip from Make-A-Wish, Illinois. And um, the kid, by the way, uh, did beat it. And he's now, I don't know his actual age, but he's in high school healthy as a horse. It's, you know, and not everybody involved in Make-A-Wish is, you know, is, is on a terminal path. A lot of, a lot of them get better. Um, but this, uh, it just kind of touched me. Make-A-Wish gave the kid a trip down to Disney World. And um, that's when I started to just learn a little bit more about it. Um, and yeah, I, as you've, we've talked to death earlier, I'm into running a lot. So the park actually, uh, opened up a bridge over a river that made it a little more, more accessible. And I'd always had this little half marathon course in my mind. And so 2013, and talk about use of technology, there was, it was scalable and there was no risk, really. I just kind of got the word out, hey, anybody want to do a half marathon? And next thing you knew, I had about 300 people signed up um, using just basic online tools and word of mouth through Facebook. Um, it ended up at, we kind of peak at about 650 participants now. Um, in the first few years, we would raise something like twelve, thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars a year. That's what we would net after paying off porta potties and all that. Uh, and the proceeds would go to Make a Wish. Now the proceeds go to Make a Wish and also to the park itself, which which needs to be benefited. So it's um, it's one of those things. I mean, I, I'm I just I just kind of wanted to get under the skin of how, what it would be like to direct a race and get it all set up for whatever reason. And this was a what I would call a sort of non-controversial charity. I have a hard time with a lot of different charities and you can't be against, you know, children and helping out families who are dealing with crap that I cannot even imagine. And um, so it's just, it's just been a great fusion of interests and spare time. <laughs> and uh, we've put $85,000 to make a wish uh, over these, these years. Now, this is going to be our eight. This was going to be our eighth annual um, coming up this year. And it's all other people's money. I'm not patting myself on the back, but it's really cool to have facilitated something like that. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to see you watching it because I know that you are civic-minded, that you give a crap about society too. And if anything, this shows someone like you who is inherently an entrepreneur that there are some, there are some ways out there to really make a difference. I, I, it's the biggest difference I've ever made on anything, you know, and I, I just love it as a success story for how any individual person could find a way to, um, to benefit a place like that. That was a bit soapboxy, but you asked. I liked so. it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's great because you mentioned sort of the entrepreneurship angle. It makes me think about it from that side of things, of course, but you recognized this opportunity. It, it was, it's, it's almost about recognizing inevitable opportunities where yeah. every, everybody loves Allerton park. Who's in this area and not just loves it, but fanatically loves it. If they live within this radius of, of things, because this place is so dang unique and such a great thing uh, to live near. I, I don't even know if we would have moved to Monticello had it not been for Allerton park, frankly, right. Because what else would there have been to do really to get out in nature? And that's always been important for you. Or where, where would you go run? Right. Um, so you saw that as an as an opportunity. And then several, just a couple years earlier, I think there had been a 5K that had been started in Monticello that kind of was a little proof of concept. Like there are runners here too, you know, and, 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 and you knew that because I'm sure you saw them all on the trails all the time with you at Allerton. But there was a little bit of like, there's an infrastructure here that could be made. That That's kind of just the entrepreneurship brain. But the fact that you were able to grow that into such a, a large scale event that was able to raise so much money. And I think 
you you got to recognize too that the reason the the margin for donation it's not a, I guess it's not a profit margin it's a donation margin sure. is so high from that event is because you hustled around to a bunch of vendors and connections in town and said will you be there supporting this and what will you give us for free and how can we make this a thing and so that's ultimately why it was able to raise so much money um was was because you said I can put the hours there and I can donate those hours and be persuasive and get everybody involved. And that's why it's grown to the place that it's grown. So um, this year, uh, we are just coming up on what would have been race weekend just soon here. So um, how are you handling the coronavirus situation? I know you're doing something unique. We are. Um, I, I don't take no for an answer. And so um, we created the virtual version of the race. And uh, that kind of means what it sounds like. I did not invent virtual racing. It's been out there for a while. But uh, yeah, for this year, I already had 140 people signed up initially before the word started, you know, that things started to get weird. Um, so I just switched that over and said, look, we're going to turn this into a virtual race. And subject to whatever public health edicts we have in front of us at any given time um, during the period, which is about to come up for doing it, you can go do a run on your own. Um, if the park is going to remain open, you can do it there. And if it doesn't remain open, and it didn't for a while, um, you can do it you know, out in your own neighborhood or whatever. And uh, I had and still have 500 initial medals uh, coming across from overseas um, to give to people. <laughs> so I, I wanted to get rid of them. So um, yeah, at this point, I, I reduced the, the race fee. And now anybody anywhere uh, can go online and, and run virtual Allerton. And uh, the way those things usually work is you, if you have like a Garmin, good for you. But if you just have a cell phone, um, there are a couple of different apps you can use. I like Map My Run. Um, you can actually pre-plan a course for yourself uh, and then go out and run it. And your phone will actually help guide you a little bit and time it and it'll show your results. And you can just email those in. Or you can, uh, like I often do, I just put my phone, you know, hit start and it's tracking me GPS style. And it tells me when I've done either my 5K, my 10K, or my half marathon, and uh, you could send that in. So that's that's kind of the nature of it. And then on top of that, um, I coined the phrase, I believe I coined the phrase, the social, parentheses, distance media event of the year. Um, social distance media, you see, that's pretty funny. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah There's Steve Martin, everybody. There it is, yeah. Well, you got to sell the joke. But um, And so the idea is that people will, and I've already had a couple do this, you send in pictures of yourself doing it, or in this case, training for it so far, and I'm going to we'll have some prizes for, you know, the best picture. If you tell a story about what you did for your virtual, um, there'll be a prize for that. And just in general, the sharing of it on Facebook. And I, I now finally have a slightly growing presence on Instagram. Uh, so people will be able to see what each other did. It becomes part of the whole culture of inspirational, what we're doing during the quarantine, you know, kind of story. Um, and we're not going to make as much, but at least we're not going to lose our butts on the medals. <laughs> and... Um, and I'm just, I'm hopeful that it'll catch on. Make-A-Wish Illinois, uh, is actually the beneficiary of, uh, Allerton is also another beneficiary of it, but Make-A-Wish is, they said they're going to promote, um, the thing a bit further. And so actually for the first time I could get some interest in, you know, their zone up in Chicago, there could be a whole lot of people who support them up there, uh, who, who might jump in and do this. So I'm, I'm kind of excited about it. We have a few weeks left before, um, actually I'm going to extend it. So we have like a month left before it's going to like be over, over. Um, but it's, it's just, it's how we adapt. It's not, you know, quite the same, but to get us through this year, I have a lot of people who are like me, fans of the race and, uh, they felt bad about it getting shut down and, um, you know, they're going to continue to support it. And so that it's, it's, you know, we move on we do what we can. Well, we, we, we all need it more than ever right now is a sense of, of optimism and, and also caring about others and doing something for other people. And yeah. runners need a reason to go run. And yeah. uh, Make-A-Wish needs your help now more than ever, ultimately. I mean, I, I of the darker things I can think of um, that is going on right now is the Make-A-Wish kid who may not get their wish right now. Uh, it just um, tears me up. That tears me up heartbreaking i think uh all of our small problems are just nothing yeah well um, we're gonna get through this right i mean but if you yeah. there are i mean out there there are people who this this was it this may be their last summer right. I, I i said it out loud i mean it's true um there's an entire village down in Kissimmee, florida that i'm i've done some work with them as well 
And they are, they are basically a resort that can hold up to, I think it's 220, it's about to get bigger, 220 families um, who come down there. So those, those Make-A-Wish people from all over the country and even outside from other countries, Israel and UK, they come to this place and stay there. And it's, a, it's an amusement park of its own, basically, in, in some ways. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, oh, tangent. The place is called Give Kids the World, gktw.org. An amazing, amazing place that is a village full of wish kids from around the world, and it is closed right now. Um, and and f- we would look at that. We, you know, we think of other Disney resorts that are closed. If you made plans, it's like, ah, oh, crap, we got to go next year. When I think of the village being closed, it, it, it rips me up. It just, it just rips me up um, how special that place is to a lot of people. But anyway, but, but Make-A-Wish Illinois is same kind of a deal. Um, and... You know, increasingly, a lot of people are adapting to a very weird situation, and the first thing that happens is their their spontaneous charitable contributions um, understandably go away. So I'm I'm really hopeful that you know we can keep awareness up, if nothing else, with this. Well, thing. I I know I've got running friends and and possibly running listeners and walking. Um, by the way, walking and friends walking. are welcome. We and do this it's is, it's uh... a run walk, and a lot of people like there are people who couldn't. Can, they just didn't want to do it out in public before. There's some walkers who have volunteered who are like, I'm going to do it now. I can walk it. So anyway, sorry, right. go ahead. <laughs> no, but uh, who, who yeah, I, I can't think of a better cause to and a, and a better reason to get yourself outside. Um, how uh, do you have to do it all in one sitting? That was my question because for, for generally, just purely uh, injury f- the fact that I want to be injury free, I never mm. run more than like three miles at a time. Like I just well, think yeah. Anything past that, and you, maybe you're begging for it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> That's how, how well, we have we have a five k, so if you can stretch and do the three point one, there you go. But okay. um, I, I, you know, the, the, anything goes here, really. And this is really a charitable event. So if there's somebody out there who they'd like to do a half marathon, if they could do it in stages. That's fine. Record how you did it, and that's a great story. We would welcome that. And here comes your medal. You know, if if somebody wants to do do it that way, and this year, um, kind of like Disney, I, I've given them some goofy names, but um, you can do combinations of all three of the different races if you want to do them. I have a few people who signed up to do that. They're going to do all three events, and uh, actually, the five k doesn't currently have a medal because the medals that are shipping across from overseas already say. 10k and half marathon on them but we're working on something for the 5k <laughs> um, so but yeah you're um you you even if you said that this was going to be your last year running this and you were going to pass the reins you know next year you kind of can't do that now you kind of have to show up for one more year so that you can be there for the for for another uh in-person half marathon how long do you see yourself doing this for as as long as you're able or is there a point where you move on to another thing and let somebody else have the reins on this one i don't know i i, I really enjoy doing it and it gives me an excuse to go to Allerton. Um, I've always been keen on trying to get the overall contribution up above six digits, you know, up to six digits. That would be cool. Um, 10 years is a nice number, but I, I would hate, to, I mean, as long as this is, it's a joy to do. Um, it kind I don't want to get cocky, but it gets a little easier each year. It's not, I'm not quite as frantic. There are some amazing people in Monticello, Illinois, uh, who, do their volunteer part and and it's not it doesn't all just fall on me like a burden i think some of the first years especially because of my lack of organization it kind of did but it gets better now and i i don't you know if i'm able to keep keep it running great if somebody emerges who wants to take it over and um and run with it that'd be cool but we've actually moved a little bit closer to the park now so uh, i don't i don't have any plans to give it up but you're absolutely right i mean if this was going to be my last year no 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 (laughs) i can't go out like this you for sure can't. You have to be there yeah. for <laughs> at exactly. least one final party. <laughs> yeah, that's the hope for sure. I I, yeah. I thank you for bringing that up, though. I mean, I don't know if um if it'll catch on or not, but there is um it's pretty easy to find us online. I mean, on Facebook we're just Allerton Races. <clears throat> Same thing on Instagram, and now we are runallerton.weebly.com is a way to get to our actual website. Thanks for asking, and um, so so we are easy to look up. And it's also pretty easy to participate in. So if anybody is listening out there, I think it's uh, it's great fun and a, and a great cause. And then, you know, if you get into it in 2021, hopefully some people from out of state uh, will come and actually do the real race and uh, and spend the night there because there's lodging in the park. The place is freaking amazing. Yeah, I I can attest. I I worked there. That's um, right. You did as a as a 
I don't I don't know what I was. <laughs> I helped with. I know they liked you. I, I remember that. some of the wedding coordination and and conference yeah. sales and things like that. And um, it uh, the various lodging that they have is so freaking nice. It's uh, it puts most hotels and um, Airbnbs to shame for sure. Yeah, um, it's, it's fun. I've, I've yeah because of the race director thing, I've been able to stay in the the cheapest of the places, and there's just something really cool about waking up out there. It's just which one was the place you got to stay at? I got to stay at the the Evergreen, which is it's like motel style, um, and the rooms. Are oh small. yeah, I remember that place. Yeah, a little bit a little bit Spartan, but you're right up against the the woods, and that's um, almost like camping in a cabin. It feels like a little bit, yeah. Yeah, it's so it's so but, cozy, man. I it's just it's a great place to be. Yeah, yeah, and well, um support supporting the town of Monticello which of course is uh where I went to high school and spent a good few years there and is a lovely town and um the more we can get people out there that's that's good news too so yeah well that's a nice I feel like that's a nice note to end it on generosity caring you know not all the sad depressing yeah. stuff that we that we uh, are all thinking about right now so maybe I, maybe I feel like thanks to me you got it backwards thanks to me and so if anybody was listening at first, they, they probably just like, I can't take it anymore. And by the time we got to the really fun stuff, <laughs> <laughs> I totally yeah. screwed you on this one, buddy. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe, but, yeah. um, but that is a good note. And then, uh, I'm, I'm even trying to think of what I typically ask guests. I always ask guests sort of about the place, uh, that, that I'm visiting at the time, which obviously I am, I am not visiting you at the moment. But you're going to, online. right? Won't you? Yeah, I Please. I would like to get up to Indiana at some point. I can't say that yeah. you've got all of the exciting things that say the Southwest has that I've been enjoying, oh. but um, somebody's got to help you get that motorcycle uh, up and running because it's just depressing every time you tell me about things you've done with that motorcycle and how how sad it is and lonely. Well, and you know how much I I love that motorcycle, um, but when we got to Orlando, the just the way people drive down there, I. I still want to live. So that thing sat for three years under a cover in Orlando weather. Yeah. And it's not been nice to it. I, I believe I'll be able to polish off the, the problems on the Chrome, but um, I'm going to need to put new tires on it anyway. But hey, it's sad. It's sad. I, as, a, as someone who loves motorcycling and I, you, you didn't get that from me, by the way, you latched on just because I had one and I saw you go crazy on your own, but um, it's, it's a shame. It's a disgrace what I've done to mine, but I hope to redeem <laughs> myself. Once we get things put together here, yeah. Well, we've got a trip yeah. planned when we when we get to Indiana yeah. that you and I have to ride to Monticello to get uh, Filippo's, right. which is a family tradition. Let's do that. Since I, I mean, I, I'm. It's it's bizarre how we got to West Lafayette and we kind of have gone into quarantine. So to ask me how's West Lafayette, what can you recommend? I don't know it yet, <laughs> you know. But let's talk about Monticello. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, yeah, which, the place that is the host of the Allerton races. Yeah. Um, lovely so, town. Yeah, and I and I think you know for for people like if it's about visiting, uh, people who are enthusiasts of nature and woods and this and by the way there's a there's a mansion there that's historic so there's a, there's a great history it's like a the Biltmore of Illinois I just made that up it's going to be a big that's pretty good phrase but it's um and then the statuary that's out there including this big Italian mistake of a statue called the Sun Singer which is out in a clearing the park is so unique and and. Uh, that's the thing to see. I mean, honestly. And then the food to eat is Filippo's. Italian, genuine Italian, um, best pizza in the world. And I get, I get crazy about it, as you know. Always have. Um, but, but here's a nice town. And I was, so, I was so glad that we could do, what was it, eight-ish formative years of your life um, there in, in Monticello, just in terms of the safety of that town and uh cleanliness whatever <laughs> and, and some variety out. you know i mean it worked out i think um as a real little kid we lived in muhammad and yeah. we were near uh lake of the woods park there that was um, on purpose so i kind of got to uh, we were quite literally across the street from the entrance to that park and so that's front yard i always said that's our yeah front yard. so i got to grow up um we would we would go canoeing or fishing on the lake or just run around that park good place to run or walk or bike yeah. or anything um playgrounds even so that was a good place for a little kid and then monticello had another aspect which was there were plenty of places you could go and be with your um group of friends in really great environments like at allerton like you could go with a group of friends to allerton and i don't i, I can't even think of all the great things we did i i had mm -hmm. a number of dates there because it was a great date spot 
Um, or you'd, I remember playing like flag football there with a group of friends once yeah. or so many different things. Um, so it, yeah, I think both places worked out, um, in that way. But I do, yeah. I, I weirdly do miss Monticello. I mean, it's, it's, um, if you, if you, I think that, um, most, uh, most people don't like high school, uh, who I, who I associate with. Like, uh, if you liked high school, I probably don't have a lot in common with you. Mm-hmm. Um, but, <laughs> but it doesn't mean that I didn't like the town. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's two separate things. Yeah. And of my course, high school I was... is crap, but I, I met your lovely mother there and I'm, there you go. I mean, I'm luckiest man on earth, honestly, when it comes to that. And, uh, yeah, there's, I don't know. Everything happens for a reason, but yeah, I, I you know, nothing's perfect, but yeah. in that region we did pretty well. And, yeah. and you know, we, we've, we've been nomadic, nothing like you and Andrea, but, We've now gone to, uh, we went to Waco, Texas, flipped a house, went to Auburn, Alabama, then we went to Orlando, and we've come back up here to West Lafayette. We've not even come close, I think, to finding a community that we liked as much as Monticello, um, just for uh, it's reasons that are kind of hard to explain, but just that sense of there's enough space to breathe here, um, people are genuine, and uh, there's Filippos, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, it's been good. I'm glad you remember it fondly. I think everything... Even now, I mean, everything everything we did back then about where we were going to live, it was always about, like, what's what's going to be best for them? Because we felt like we could probably tolerate, you know, pretty much anything. But um, we wanted you to like where you were brought up at. Right, so yeah. We shifted it, a couple times, but... There's going to be enough in your adolescence that you can be resentful of that uh, there's... At least you have to have a couple things that you did like. <laughs> well, you know, Joe Rogan said... <laughs> this is the third time I did, Joe Rogan said um, that... Uh, interesting. All interesting people had uh, crappy childhoods, right? Uh, or what? The, what the contrapositive of that? Whatever. He's like, you know. So if you're if you had a good childhood, you're not interesting. And he was worried about his own kids because he thinks he's a good dad. But right. I think you, I think you and, and your sister are exceptions to that. By the way, I think you're very well. Thank you. That's very yeah. nice of you to say. <laughs> but um, but yeah, uh, a a good place. And and I like that Allerton races is sort of the plug on this one. I don't. Yeah, me too. Thank I, you. I think um. Uh, remind us the the handle one more time because I always do that at the end. So many different ways to go. I think for most people using social media, just Allerton races two words. Look it up and you'll find it. But we are uh, run Allerton as one word. Dot Weebly dot com is another way to find us. So perfect. And then yeah. uh, along with the episode, it's going to be a little different this time because I don't have a photo of the two of us in person uh, f- on this episode. So I'm going to need to do what I need you to do is send me send me some pictures of you and me uh, when I was young. Maybe that'd be oh. a good. Like a little Would you do, do you that think, really? You think mom could dig up something like that? You know she can. I'm surprised yeah. you'll use them. You were such a cute kid. Everybody, we'll find the cute ones because there was a good. Kid. There was a good span of some awkward years in there. Like anyone, I don't know about those. But uh, but yeah, if you can have uh, if you can have mom dig up some of those, maybe I'll throw like a wedding photo or two in there so the people see the the evolution too. Um, I'll, I'll post that with the episode so you can find me at T Hicks and Life as always on Instagram and also at T Hicks and Life on Twitter. I am trying people to use Twitter um, to find guests, and I have I've had some success with it so far, at least in scoping some guests. I'm hoping to do more once this uh, this lockdown is all over and we get back to the normal flow of things. Um, and in the meantime, I'm just going to keep producing episodes with what I've got. So there's a chance I'll get Andrea on an episode. Uh, yes. I gotta see if I can talk her into it, um, but. Uh, but maybe, and maybe I'll go online for another episode. So I'm, I'm working it out. I'll do what I can do, uh, on the road so that you don't have to miss out on, on such exciting, uh, lovely content as we're making here. So, uh, <laughs> so stay tuned. Uh, thank you to my dad, Dean, for jumping on the episode. It was a lot of fun having you. Um, anything you want to leave the people with? What's the main takeaway here from this episode? I had fun too for any potential guests. It's therapeutic. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. And Keep it I positive, would say that, right? Is that this wasn't a whole lot different than you and I talking on the phone. I feel as boring as some of this may have been. Um, that was genuine, man. <laughs> yeah, no, there's so, no act here. I tr- at yeah, least I try. I, I, uh, I always love talking with you, and I enjoy listening to other people talk with you. So if if I'm a if I'm a podcast audience of one, that's too bad. Keep them coming. But um, I, I do love your show. Uh, I think objectively, I like I like so much about what you're doing. I like the 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 roam around get to know people uh, nature of it i think there's a great message in that because maybe with present company being accepted strangers are with me and i think everybody's got a story and i think um it's it's fun to just 
pull it out of people. I love the variety that you're getting. And um, anyway, I'm just patting your back now. There's my well, message. Thank, yeah, that's good for the <laughs> ego. It's really important for the ego. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Um, well, thank you everybody for listening and thanks to my guest and, uh, whatever we do next, it will be something and it will be exciting. I'll make sure to, to, to keep throwing curveballs while we've got to deal with this quarantine situation. So, um, so stay tuned and as always, we'll see you on the next episode. Bye.